Welcome to the Age of Fission radio show with your host, Lonnie Clark. We stand together and accept we now live in a world transformed by the nuclear industry. We expose and confront the intentional neglect and disregard for life on our planet by atomic energy. Consider social engineering programs who view our bodies, minds, and souls as assets on a balance sheet. We discuss vital current issues, interview activists, and engage our audience in an effort to allow all voices to be heard. We encourage our listeners to reclaim their power and their courage to take action to save our planet from the ravages of greed and indifference. Every voice matters. Our actions matter. We remind our listeners that happiness is resistance. Love is greater than fear. Good evening. This is your host, Lonnie Clark, with the Age of Fission Radio Show. I want to thank you for joining us, and I want to thank all of our listeners and subscribers to our channel and to our uh, podcast, and I want to thank you for sharing the information. And I encourage you to share this video or the podcast wherever you hear us. Uh, please do let people know about this information because it is kind of the untold secret that is affecting everybody on the planet. So I want to really thank you for joining us and caring enough about our planet to listen to this. Uh, rather, these are harsh conversations. I get it. They're not the easiest. Uh, and we rattle off a lot of stuff on this channel that a lot of people have are hearing for the first time. I, I tend to forget because I've been covering this now probably I think it's been six years going on six years uh, uh, fu- the Fukushima disaster happened 3-11-11 and I didn't really understand until 3 uh, till 5-12-2012 and uh, 12. it was May, May 5th 2012 when I really first heard about it today I have with us a, a, go- a a guest that I asked to be on. It's kind of a spontaneous interview. It has, it's not planned. I just said, hey, you want to do an interview with me? And he said, yes. So I'm really delighted to have with us uh, Mr. Sean McGee. He is a contributor to nuclear-news.net. And uh, anyone who is uh, interested in understanding about radioactivity and the health effects and just exactly what's going on, this is like one of the best sites where you can get comprehensive information uh, about nuclear in all of its aspects. You, can, you will read about nuclear weapons, nuclear power plants, nuclear disasters, nuclear victims, and they also cover other... There's Sometimes they waver off of that, but this is almost entirely where it goes, so I really encourage all of you to go there, but... Mr. Sean McGee is with us, and I really appreciate you joining us, Sean. Ah, it's my pleasure. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, been a little while since we last had a little talk, and quite a lot's happened since. Uh, oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, where do you want to go with this? Well, oh, my gosh. I, you know you know what my number one thing is about the nuclear denial? And I think it always goes back to, you know, we always – We were just talking, uh, before we started recording, we were talking about his current website because I, I am researching, I just found out, now I've been doing this and this is the first I heard about it. I'm researching about a toxic, they call them legacy sites and they're all Manhattan Project nuclear waste sites. That's what they call them. Whenever there's a nuclear dump site, whenever, whenever they're finished with their nuclear, uh, bomb making or processing or any of that uh, when they're finished with it they just call them a legacy site so whenever you hear the term toxic legacy it usually means radioactivity in the United States so there's one called Treasure Island off of San Francisco uh, it was off of San Francisco Bay in 1942 the U.S. has basically replanted 1800 low income people there and they are extremely sick and I was thinking about the denial of the nuclear. It's my my ongoing theme here is the nuclear denial. You and you and I were talking about it, and I encourage people to go to this. The um, at the scroll down to the bottom of the page, and you will see something on the Chernobyl disaster. 
So, Sean, why don't you talk to these people and tell them what you guys have, are posting here. And It's kind of stunning what's happened to the people in Chernobyl. Well, I mean, they had the uh, HBO uh, sort of uh, Chernobyl series recently that's been widely discussed, and uh, and it was a dramatised kind of version of uh, what happened in Chernobyl. Um, it was kind of technically right in some respects, and you know, in how the actual accident happened, and um, so. Uh, it, it looks like it was done uh, based in Europe. Um, there's a lot of European actors involved with it. Um, it's uh, it's certainly a little bit of a surprise about how much detail they allowed. Um, yeah, and that, that me too. That shocked me that they actually yeah. allowed. But you know what? I figured they did because it's Russia. So they let all the bad stuff come out because it's Russia. <laughs> Well, it, it, to be honest with you, you know, there was a lot of Russians there that were doing good stuff as well, right. you know, so it's, um, it, 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 it wasn't, a, it was quite balanced, it was dramatised. I mean, I did actually engage with the uh, the guy that actually uh, uh, wrote the thing, or directed it, I should say, and... Um, and I dropped I dropped a, uh, an update with him uh, where at the end where they've got the um, sort of uh, people of Pipriat, the town that was nearby, yeah. uh, they get all bussed away eventually uh, and uh, they get taken away. And, uh, uh, of course, that's it. That you don't really hear much. All you see is a couple of snippets of them in these housing somewhere. And um, where that somewhere was, where they were taken, like where the girl was taken, and you see her afterwards, and she loses her kid, and this, that, and the other. Um, that is actually Kiev, uh, which is in Ukraine. Wow. Um, and they, they don't, I, I don't think, obviously, they wanted to talk too much about Ukraine at the moment because of all the politics yeah. and, yeah. Uh, you know, the geopolitics and that. But, however, they were taken to Ukraine. And um, as they get shipped away, uh, basically uh, they uh, they then get moved to these uh, this area in uh, or around you, uh, Kiev, which is the, the the sort of main city in Ukraine. And um, and what happened was, is when I was talking to this um, uh, this guy, I said, "Well, have you actually followed up what happened to all those people?" And um, so what I did, I dropped, um, uh, well, I went to a meeting in 2013 and, uh, where a Ukrainian NGO called Zamyeka, uh, Zamyeki, I should say, uh, was uh, doing a talk and it was a Mrs. Ms. Tamara um, Krasitskava, excuse me for butchering the name, and uh, she she was in charge of this NGO and she was working with these uh, 44,000 people that were evacuated there. And during the course of the meeting, uh, basically they turned around and they were, um, sort of, she was telling us uh, all the sort of various stories about the health issues and various things that were going on with these people. And um, in the meeting, uh, she actually quoted that only 40% of the evacuees that moved to Kiev after the disaster were alive in 2013. Um, and uh, she basically said, you know, in terms of numbers, she said there was 44,000 people evacuated to Kiev, you know, approximately, um, but only 19,000 approximately were left alive and that very few of them had made it much past 40 years old. Wow. So, you know, at the end of the day, that's, you know, what, what the, um, uh, I, mean, I mean, these statistics are not widely known, but uh, what, they, what the nuclear industry has been saying, um, you know, we, who has been in the last number of years been fronted by uh, Professor Geraldine Thomas, you see her on television, you see her at the, uh, uh, well, you see her all over the place on the papers, and, you know, she gets uh, the BBC, you know, she gets, and she's been in Fukushima, um, and so on and so on, 
And uh, what her response is is that well, a lot of these people they were smoking cigarettes, and you know, uh, and it was all the stress and everything, you know. Uh, yeah, the usual. <laughs> Honestly, this is the thing that sets me off more than anything. To me, it's the only thing that I think we ought to be talking about in the nuclear stopping the nuclear industry, because the complete blanket denial of the harm to human health is really grotesque and medieval you know what i mean it's 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 you know we we think about in history about the crusades and and the horrible things that used to happen seven eight hundred years ago that that's what this is on this scale sean that's what i think i mean most of my research has actually been digging into that and we can actually have a chat about that later actually you know at the end of the day it's, it's you know it's like saying well, you know, how do we know cigarettes cause cancer? Because they know? did And at studies. the end of the day, the, 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 there's no, the, the, you know, the, the way they discovered it was by statistics. And the way that the nuclear industry um, sort of hides it is by using statistics. Yeah, so, but they, they're not honest looking, in their statistics, Sean. Hmm. They don't test. They Like all the monitors, I was talking to Thomas Ackerman this morning, all the monitors in Canada are turned off. All of them. There are no, they, they no longer go on. The government keeps track, but the public monitors for levels of radioactivity flying across Canada, that's why if you look at the netc.com where you can check the radioactivity across the, you know, the globe basically, Canada's completely empty because they don't keep track. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, you know, it's, uh, yeah, you, I mean, I mean, the, the, the manipulation of uh, data, statistics and all this is it's just a common thing they do. But, but you know, to, to be quite honest with you, uh, you know, we, we've now got to the point where the sti- we've been able to get hold of more and more statistics. And the more statistics we get, uh, basically, and, and also the scientists themselves, you know, nuclear scientists, are sort of starting to step forward. You know, we also have Professor Chris Busby and many others like him that, that have been sort of making this point for a while. And and there's others there as well that don't get a voice. That's like true. Like Professor Keith Baverstock, you know, who was who, who basically was the one who discovered the link between, uh, and this is statistic again, but the link between uh, thyroid cancer and uh, iodine-131. The nuclear industry itself was denying that and denying it and denying it. And um, Keith Baverstock was actually in the World Health Organization, in the radiological department they had at the time. And he basically did crunch the numbers and said, right, now there is a statistical uh, connection here. And he'd he'd put his his figures down and the nuclear industry had come back and say, well, you can't count that one, you know, thyroid cancer runs in the family. And that that one there could have been caused by alcohol and that one could have been caused by cigarette. So they'll come back and then he reduces his numbers. But even though he reduced his numbers, he could still say, well, look, there's still too many kids that got thyroid cancer. And so so basically, he was the one that made... But what happened to him, I think it was 2001, uh, The they closed the radiological protection uh, board down in the World Health Organization and moved it over uh, under the auspices of the IAEA, IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, who promote nuclear en- energy. So they then had the control with the ICRP and the UNSCIRS to actually control the actual data themselves and have it hidden, have it under the table and not have this, this upstart professor, you know, Keith Baverstock who actually I will talk about again later because he, he come, but he basically turned around. He was moved. He, he was made, you know, jobless. Yeah. But he moved to Finland and he's still working up in Finland today. And he hasn't been stopping his, his, his research Good. and the Finnish who have a nuclear industry. I mean, when I go on to the Finnish websites, they have all their data, all their reports yeah. in English as well as Finnish, and they have it all up there. 
and you can find out that, for instance, nuclear nuclear power stations create NO2, which is a worse greenhouse gas than CO2. Really? Now, the industry doesn't tell you that. But if you go onto the Finnish website, you know, this is the, the Finnish nuclear industry, you know, which is a gold standard in the nuclear industry in my books. And they would turn around and they would say, well, we tried to put, you know, we were going to put a filter on top to stop the NO2 getting out into the atmosphere. But what happens is, instead of NO2, it just becomes NO something else. And it doesn't, you know, there's no point putting the filter there, basically, because all they can do is slightly change it, and it doesn't make any difference. And they end up with a radioactive filter they've got to, you know, so deal with. So do you follow Greta Thunberg on Twitter? Um, yeah, yeah, no, of course. Have we, you we, we, made this argument to her and, and sent her any documentation on this and said, look, you want to fight the greenhouse gases? You've got to get no, to she, her. She, she's against nuclear anyway. And and the, the, the argument for nuclear really is, is, a, is a dead duck in terms of using it for climate change or anything because it's just, it's just much quicker and easier I mean, to pull up. Well, they're trying to, yeah, but they're not oh managing God. it. Well, look what they just gave well, to Saudi they do, Arabia. They, they actually sell the third world nations. What it is, it's like a Ponzi scheme in the nuclear industry. That's right. If they can, if they can, if they can um, say, right, we're going to sell a reactor to South Africa, um, what will happen is money will be generated, reports will be done, uh, you know, money will flow, um, and because of that, then they can go to investors and say, look, we've got this, this deal. And so they can get some money out of investors. They can get some money out of the taxpayer. And then they, and then of course it fails. Like just recently, South Africa has said, well, actually, we don't want your nuclear reactor, Mr. Russia. And, uh, and that's, that's the end of that. And that's happening in the Western world, in Russia, and mm. even in China. They can't sell these things. Because, you know, at the end of the day, they're just not cost effective and they're just, you know, just on that alone. They're just so good. I mean, the thing is, not even this, just not even just, they don't even, they've created such a mess. Like, if they turned off every nuclear generating everything and we went completely no nukes 100%, we have millions of years of issues to deal with here physical effects that we don't even can't even imagine for generations to come because of it it's it's well i mean i mean i think i think we me and you probably have a a slightly different view you know well i don't don't know if we do actually but you know i I would say that there are other toxins like lead and various other toxins that are in I mean, there's, there's toxins that, 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 that all industry uses and, um, you know, it, but, but from, from a perspective, you know, we need to stop the nuclear reactors, you know, because at the end of the day, they're just creating more and more and, you know, they're polluting more and more. And, you know, and, and most of the worst of the sort of pollution comes in the local area or downriver or downwind and uh you know and it, it that what you're saying about it you know like for cesium it, it's 600 years that's going to be you know there um if you're if you're allowing uranium particles to get out well yeah. that's a much well, as you're saying you're well, going look at plutonium plutonium is everywhere yeah. hmm. plutonium well, is I, everywhere they bombed the daylights out of us with plutonium in the world World War Two. Half life is twenty four thousand five hundred years, so it's not going anywhere. Mm. I mean, it does it does change like plutonium uh, will change uh, into other types, but then again, you've got americium that's actually worse than plutonium. Exactly, but then they break. It. But the thing is, else. the effects on the human body doesn't really decrease if you're if there's plutonium out there it's going it's it, it this is the thing when I, as i began to really grasp this like when i read john goffman's book poison power and i read that inside their standard where they say use a male 28 year old 
and talk about external exposure only because all of these quote safety effects, none of them have anything to do with internal exposure. It's all external. And but when I realize like inside that standard of creating those standards, the United States government, the NRC on their website says that for every rem of radiation in the air per million people, they know they will get 32,000 cancers a year and 225 birth defects every year. This yeah. is why we have an explosion of birth defects and cancer. And it, it's right there. And it, people, I mean, I, I'm non, to be honest, Sean, this is why I keep doing the podcast. It's like emotional therapy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause <laughs> really, this is, it's incomprehensible. The, uh, I, I, I guess what I call it is the, you know, it's, it's even beyond apathy. It's, are you actually hearing that drilling noise? Uh, not much. Why is there some drilling going on? Yeah, there's building work going on downstairs. Downstairs. And where are you yeah. now? You're in Uh-oh. Ireland. Yeah. yeah. You're in Ireland. So, uh, all right. I'm gonna stop. You might have to edit, do a bit of editing here. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all right. We can keep going. I don't mind. I mean, this is our. This is actually. An interesting conversation. It's an impromptu interview. We sort of let people know that ahead of time. So we're, I think we're good. I actually wanted to ask you what you thought about that. Uh, did you guys see that little 36 or it's a minute and a half uh, YouTube video with the Union of Concerned Scientists going to Washington, D.C. and asking people, do you know how many nuclear weapons that there are in the world? All oh, right. How did that go? I didn't see it. It was but. really hilarious. They and they and I guess part of that. Then they asked the same people, like, "Do you know how many weapons the United States has? And do you know how much they cost?" So people it varied. People. Some people said they had like six thousand weapons. Some people said we had a hundred. There's actually fourteen thousand nuclear weapons in the world, yeah. and the, the United States has six of them. Russia has six. And I think they said that... 6,000, you mean? Yeah, 1,000. 6,000, yes. And we are... The United the United States is busy upgrading their nuclear weapons as we speak. So at, that means, guess how much they cost? It's mm. something like $153 million an hour. Oh, uh, at least, yeah. It's yeah. just I mean, that- a ridiculous amount of money. It's a very short, uh, it's called Union of Concerned Scientists. They have their own YouTube channel. And they don't make very many YouTube videos. I subscribe to uh-huh. them. And it's a very, it's very, it's very clever. He just goes in and asks people what, it, and it's a really great way for people to understand how much we discount it, like we have literally been trained to completely ignore the nuclear industry. That's true. Yeah. I mean, I mean, to to be honest, it's, um, it's uh, in two thousand and five. Funnily enough, four years after they managed to wink Professor Pr- uh, Bavistock out of the World Health Organization and keep him away from you know, causing any trouble. Uh, about five years later, they started a big PR campaign uh, to get, you know, uh, nuclear to rise up again. Uh, but, I mean, I mean, to be honest, I, th- I personally think it's failed now. I think nuclear is a dead duck. Um, for me now, it's... Uh, it, it, my main uh, priority is the victims, of you know, the downwinders in America, the people that... You mean being, all of uh, us, like all of us. We're all... I mean, this well, is the well, reality. I, I, would, I would say there are people... Uh, like, I had two friends that were living in Utah. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, sorry, a friend that was living in Utah. Um, and uh, he was in London with me, and uh, we were both in doing CND uh, sort of Greenpeace stuff and what have you. And um, was it Blanche? Is, oh, Did Blanche go? Was that Kevin Blanche go out and meet you? N- no, no, a it, different it guy. Uh, no, no, this, yeah, no, this was uh, he, he was he was like top 
in CND uh, and Greenpeace. We did the, uh, you know, the sort of Rainbow Warrior. Oh uh, yeah, crap. yeah, yeah. And um, and so basically, he was, you know, when when you pick his phone up, you could hear the clicks. It was good old days. This is like you know, forty years ago. It was like clickety clickety click. So you know, you couldn't make a call without it being uh, listened to. It was quite funny. Well, you can't um, make a call uh, now for it out of being listened to. So well, I mean, him and his brother were downwinders. They were they were uh, in Utah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what happened was is that they uh, when they were born, you know, because the, the the bombs happened, and then you know he was born, and uh, but him and his brother both had internal organs that hadn't formed properly. It's a bit like all the babies that you oh, see in the wow. you know, that are born even today. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, stillbirths and and they have lot, you know, quite serious uh, birth, birth defects. Yeah, I mean the the infants in utero are the that's what Dr. Linus Pauling proved. Infants in utero are the most affected. I mean, it is really true. I mean, well, both him and his brother had these internal organs that were slightly slightly malformed. But it, one of the big things, his biggest problem, I think it was um, he had a lot of. Uh, what do you call it when you're, you're uh, allergies? That's it. He had a lot oh, of allergies. Yeah. Um, you know, weak, weakened immune system, basically. Yeah. So he had that. And he, you know, he, he, actually, I was having a pint of beer in a pub with him the day after uh, the day. Well, actually, when we found out about Chernobyl, we found out about it in the morning. And I looked at him. I knocked on his door because he was next door. And I said, look, we're going down the pub. Because it's going to rain later, and I don't want to be out in the rain. And this was 1986. You were doing anti-nuclear and Greenpeace stuff in 1986. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, uh, but but that was before. You know, it, that was the, that was kind of before. Um, you know, and it was, it was sort of Greenpeacey kind of environmental things. You know, I was. Uh, but bottom line was he was actually. Um, he was actually, uh, you know, he, he, because he'd been downwind already, and then he was, you know, we, we'd worked out that, you know, that the, uh, that it was going to rain, and we knew that we didn't want to be out in the rain. So we went to this pub that was just across the road, and we were playing pool and drinking beer and just looking outside as the rain came down, which was definitely being radi- radioactive at that point. Um, and it was that morning we were told that, you know, this had all happened, and it took mm. a couple of days from it. You know, from where it went from Norway to, so uh, yeah, it was, about, it was probably about about two or three days after, you know, that bit where they said, oh, you know, the West in, in HBO, they said, oh, the West West has found out. Um, it was probably about three days after that where where the Finnish and the Swedish uh, had reported it. You know, the Germans, uh, but it swung out into sea, came over Ireland, and then it came back um, towards us. And uh, it did rain. That you know, when it came in, it did rain. Um, so we were sitting. We we drank until it stopped raining, and then we staggered back. <laughs> um, yeah, we were playing pool and getting drunk, and that was my uh, claim to fame. Wow. There was another thing at the time as well. Um, uh, uh, I well, actually, I won't talk about that, but. Uh, there was the, there was a more profound experience I had, you know, as a young young lad, uh, where uh, basically that I had a, a girlfriend who was in uh, Norway, and uh, so I was really worried about her. Uh, but apparently, what happened was she was right on the west coast of Norway, hmm. and so the clouds went over the top of the mountains, right? But they'd already let all the rain had come down up right. in the mountains. You probably uh, got more radioactivity than she did at the time. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. yeah. So, this is, so was, again, was, to me, this goes again back to the underlying core issue. Like, how is it that we let the International Atomic Energy Agency off the hook about the nuclear denial? Well, it was just denial? Big PR. It was fantastic pre-R. And there were so many other things going on then. Uh, you know, there was the fall of the Soviet Union. There's just some mad yeah, stuff going on. Yeah, but what about now? Getting, like, why is not... I've heard I thought, I, I I the wanna... rainforest was the big thing at the time for mm-hmm. me um, because uh, they were cutting the rainforest down and um, uh, I was standing outside... Uh, but what was that? I can't remember the name of the film um, about the rainforest, you know, with the... Oh, 
anyway, there was a film going around which was uh, about a tribe in the rainforest and they were trying to set, you know, and what happened. And uh, people went to see it. <coughs> and when they came out of the cinemas, you know, it was uh, Friends of the Earth and me. We'd have a, a desk and we'd show them how all the rainforest was being cut down. And uh, that was a big thing for us. Uh, so there's so many, so much activism and stuff going on that the nuclear thing just got pushed behind. And of course, as we know now, that there was uh, there was a lot of corporate capture. There was, as I said, you know, the nurses that were working in Chernobyl were not talking, were told not to talk about uh, uh, the health effects they were seeing. So we and you, there wasn't the internet, so you weren't getting Ukrainians saying, "Oh, look what's happened to this," and here's a Geiger counter reading. Um, so when that happened in Fukushima, we, we, you know, uh, the first thing I did was go straight on to, uh, well, it was any news, wasn't it? Uh, it was the only place that you could find out about it. And we were all discussing it there. Um, and then, of course, from there, I went off to blogs and then others started their own blogs up and, you know, what have you. Um, and uh, we did, uh, we've been, so, you know, in yourself as well and we've been sharing all this information constantly and initially when we started sharing it the um the, the you know people like zero hedge you know the financial blogs were mm -hmm. taking it up uh we were giving them the information we were translating from japanese to english and then getting it out there um and uh you know the 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 way the internet works they would search the internet all these bots, uh, you know, these these computer programs, they gain all the information on various things and then feed it back into the stock exchange and, and to the hedge funds. And they would look at the all the news and they would decide, well, is, you know, is there more good news about, Fukush about nuclear industry or bad news? And all they would get is Fukushima, 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 you know, cancers and, you know. Uh, That's what you were talking about. This is what you meant when a few years ago, you and I were talking, I've known you for several years now, and That's right. a while yeah. back you were talking to me about the importance of constantly putting things out because it hit the algorithms, or I, I got very confused because you said yeah. it affected the stock markets, and I was like, <laughs> how could your... How could you <laughs> reposting... So this is how it works, is it's because they feed, they take the information from the internet and they feed it into the stock market computers and they test the algorithms and they do, the computers calculate the risk of investing or not investing based exactly. on what the news says. And it's exactly. not anybody like sitting in a think tank doing it. It's, it's more about the activity that they're seeing in the, oh, this is how they get away with the lies because there's more let's of them. Let's put it this way, because you mentioned Greta Thunberg. Now, she's gone viral, and you've got all these old guys going, oh, well, you know, yeah. uh, you know, she's just a, a young whippersnapper. What does she know? And do, do, right. do, do. And you know, what can she do? But what she did was an, an amazing uh, media campaign, and they would love to shut her down. And they are, actually. I'll get onto that if you want. But What's happened is is that now you're getting lots of companies divesting, yeah, from fossil fuels because all their algorithms are going, oh no, that's not a good investment, right. you know, and yeah, and it's the same thing we did with the Fukushima thing, and we killed the nuclear industry basically because of it. Well, but if you know, they killed you know, themselves. It's, it's kind of like Donald Trump, like. Okay, so the Republicans aren't exactly, going to vote for exactly. witnesses, he, he but does. he's impeaching himself. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, the nuclear industry is killing itself. Fukushima is like the last straw. It's still a freaking... In fact, every single meltdown and disaster is still a disaster. Three Mile Island is still not taken way, care of. The way Donald Trump uses his Twitter is to cover that kind of stuff. He Like, like for instance, when, when, uh, when the... Um, uh, the uh, what's it? There was uh, uh, in India, in Mumbai, the police stopped a motorcycle. On the back of the motorcycle was 20 kilos of highly enriched uranium. Now you could split that in half, bang it together, and it causes a low kiloton yield uh, explosion. Okay. Now 
when that happened, right, it, it was uh, reported in India all over the place. And I couldn't find, I only found one report on any Western uh, When was news. this? Um, that, that was the first year. Oh, no, it would have been the first year that he was, uh, he was uh, president. Oh, my God. So was that 2016, I suppose? Yeah. Yeah. Because oh, oh I, I, I did some posts on it, but they, they got no traction, mainly because when that happened, and I reckon he was told by the CIA or whoever, the Pentagon or whatever it was, to do those tweets about North Korea. That was his North Korea, first North Korea binge. And that that was to cover, so that if you did any searching on the internet and you you typed in nuclear, <laughs> you'd have just found North Korea stories, you know, thousands. Right, of them. it's kind of like this thing with the that I'm finding with Treasure Island. This report that was done by Reuters was done in 2018 or 19, and I'm like, where was I? Like, I read Reuters, it never came up. I actually searched their website. I it, it, this really blew me away. January 31st, 2019. It's from a year ago about yeah. San Francisco. Like, yeah. so it's interesting. Yeah, but I, I mean, they can manipulate, manipulate. They can swamp. That's right. And what I did, I, I just kept uh, for about one or two months afterwards. I did it, but but by that point, you know, I'm, I, we talked about censorship, and so. Uh, I'd post something on WordPress, and then it would, it you know, you couldn't find it on Google. Right. Um, and then, of course, our our blog is basically it's gone from getting 600 hits from Google a day to 40, you know, 50 or 60 maybe. You know, we're we're only getting like 10 percent uh, if we're lucky. I mean, and in fact, Bing gives us sometimes more than Google does. Right. Which is everybody right. out there. So, so, and that was a that was a couple of steps. It was 2017. It dropped, you know, it dropped down to about we were only getting, you know, I think it was like 40 percent of what we were getting. Well, today it's 10 percent, um, and that happened to Democracy Now, World Socialist website, anything that was left leaning or activist just disappeared off uh, the Google search near enough. Um, and it's uh, yeah, and like YouTube as well is doing the same thing. I, I was always getting. I don't know, I was getting like maybe 100 hits a day, you know, on all the videos I did. Uh, well, it's down to five. Hmm. So that, that just explains how. So so what, you know, I've had to actually adjust and, and to, to market. You actually now have to um, do what I did with this um, uh, latest study, which shows that microparticles that can go through the skin into your blood and, in, you know, lodge in your brain, go through the blood-brain barrier and lodge into you. There's all these studies out there. Nobody knows about them. Um, and uh, basically, uh, and, and we were talking about in taking radiation internally. Well, you know, these radi radioactive particles are I know. also toxic. Some, of, them, some right. of the radioactive particles just go right through your skin, your, like like a laser. Well, they did, It's basically kind of like a laser the way they go through well, you. Well, the, the study with that was done by King's College London, and it took them five years to peer review it, which, wow. means, which means basically that they knew about this in 2011, 2012, when Fukushima happened, right? But it was delayed for five years. And then when it came out, I don't think many people heard about it. And it was what it was to do. It wasn't to do with radiation. It was to do with uh, 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 toxic pollutant particles, right? And and uh, which were always ignored. If it was under a certain size, they only presumed that you would breathe it in and it would breathe out or it would just go through your system. Um, they didn't, you know, when they did the study, they realized that, well, actually, it would get in, you know, it, it actually would get into your system more. And they're actually much more dangerous. But up until about, I think it must have been 2013, 2014, the general advice was was that if they were micro particles or nanoparticles, um, which are the same thing, and then, you know, a cer certain size or smaller, you know, uh, like a virus in size uh, particle, uh, that they wouldn't have any effect. But in fact, they do. And this study was held up for five years before it was peer-reviewed. And when it came out, it wasn't really, you know, they, 
there wasn't any real big sort of thing made about it. So, um, and, and then another study is done, uh, which is looking at, um, so you've got the microparticle bit, but then there was like studies that were sort of looking at mit- microplastic particles uh, that are getting into the brains of fish, you know. <laughs> so, well, interestingly and, and, enough, there's reports about the microplastics but they don't talk about the microparticles of radioactivity. That's my point here, is there is such nuclear denial. Like, it is incomprehensible how we, we are not even allowed to entertain the idea that nuclear harms us. We always have, the, the first thing people say, well, it could be the cigarettes, it could be their history, their genetics. It's like my sister, she's like, well, Lonnie, you know, we have thyroid cancer in our family. I'm like, really? Who had thyroid cancer? Well, so and so. Well, when did they get their thyroid cancer? They got it in 1967 after being exposed to nuclear bombs. So we don't have a history of thyroid cancer. I mean, the bottom line is, is that with these studies, it's like, the, you know, I did this article and um, so I actually mentioned about this toxic air pollution particles found in human brains. It was done in The Guardian in 2016. Yeah. Um, so 2011 was when they start. They knew about it. It took five years to peer review. King's College uh, London was involved with it. And um, so that's that. So, OK, oh, no, air, air pollution particle. Nobody's going to really think too much about that. But they were saying it has links to Alzheimer's disease. Now, they were talking about car pollution there, right? That was that was their general thing. But uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that the the, the latest study from uh, Fukushima is that there's, uh, you know, ex- uh, cesium rich microparticles were re- and it was and it's the larger amount of uh, pollution that was released. You know, the sort of thing that Chris Busby was measuring where well, he didn't actually notice it because they're microparticles. But, you know, when he was measuring the lead in those air filters in Tokyo, mm-hmm. I don't know if you still video with that. Yeah. But if, if he if he had the right equipment, he would have probably seen cesium rich mar- uh, microparticles, you know. Um, and the bottom line is, is they brought this study out is just uh, this week. I think, yeah, this week, last week, but yeah, it was in the last seven days this, this study came out, and uh, the the main thing about that is what they said was that the um, uh, the CS rich microparticles account for a significant fraction of the deposit of CS. So, you know, the bottom line is is the estimated CS dispersion, most of it was in microparticles. And what does CS mean? What does CS mean? Uh, c- cesium, cesium, one okay. three seven or one three four. There's still one three four in it. So okay. That won't, that'll be around for another twenty thirty years. Uh, the cesium one three seven will be around for six hundred years. But these particles, they lie about, and they can be lofted with a, with a light breeze. You know, um, they can be taken up by fish and right. plants. That's right. And we can be they can be eaten. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, and there's been no studies that tie the King's College study, uh, which is to do with toxic air pollution particles found in human brains, you know, connected to cars because it was London and everything, um, uh, or, or nanoparticles, if you like. And, uh, and then basically, you know, the fact that, and it's probably the same in Chernobyl as well, that these uh, very tiny particles, uh, which are radioactive, and cesium uh, and uranium and all these other things have toxic effects as well as the radiation damage. You know, so it's a, it's a bit of a double whammy with the uh, with the right. nicer. That's right. Uh, so, so that nobody's putting these two together. If they did, then they'd be saying, "Oh, uh, cesium found in human brains." You know, there's a reason why the blood-brain barrier is there. It's to stop small particles, stop particles getting into the brain because the brain's so bloody sensitive. Um, you know, but we uh, the, the study that they did in, on the Guardian or uh, King's College London was that it was going to cause um, uh, uh, had that, that the, the the pollution they found in the brains had links to Alzheimer's, which is a big problem. You know. And uh, like people blame uh, aluminium toxicity as well. 
Um, and that's probably because of my, because, you know, aluminium, it gets worn and you probably get micro particles quite easily off aluminium. Um, and aluminium has a high energy density and stuff. So, you know, they have linked aluminium with Alzheimer's before, but really it's to do with metals and metals. Yeah. It's heavy metal item. poisoning is essentially what's going, what's going. I mean, but this is, again, I'm talking about like the new, the denial of it all. It's 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 incomprehensible to me. The, like for me, I don't think we need a lot more studies of how it harms people. Well, we I mean we don't have first off what we need is science to be free of corporate control to let well, science yeah. just go do Absolutely. its deal. We, we, need, we need we need independent scientists who who will actually like critically Dr. Talk. Chris Busby and, did and his own like I've done, you yeah. know, which is just I too two uh, peer-reviewed papers together and say, oh, there could be a problem in Tokyo. Uh, not Tokyo, but there could be certainly, well, there is, probably is, but there, there could be a really big problem allowing crowds to go to somewhere like Fukushima um, and, uh, you know, uh, stir up all the dust and everything, you, you know, the whole, because, the, because the they're, they're, area. Nobody's, nobody's measuring these microparticles. Uh, well, obviously, these Japanese scientists just have but nobody's put together the possible damage. And, of course, when you're talking about forcing people to move back to those areas, especially in in the Fukushima prefecture near the actual uh, disaster site itself. Within 10 uh, miles. I think they're telling people to go back within 10 miles. I think it was a city called Futaba, right, right next to it. Well, there was a, there was a, an article that's out today where they've got this guy who's a, uh, I think he's a Reuters, funnily enough, a Reuters um, a reporter, and he's been there four times. He said the first time he was wrapped up, you know, in gaffer tape and God knows what. Um, <coughs> on this occasion, only started wearing safety equipment when he got to such and such. Now, <coughs> you know, at the end of the day, it's, um, you know, it, it, you couldn't trust the, the Japanese government and te TEPCO to basically really sort of say, well, actually, you know, maybe we should have a 10 or 20, 30, because, you know, or, or widen that, that uh, area, uh, because they're only going by dose, and they're only going by air dose. They're not going by what's in the soil and what you're kicking up. They're only going by air dose, which is the equivalent of uh, feeling the heat off an electric fire. OK, um, as opposed to kicking around little bits of hot particles, yeah. you know, that's the difference. So, you know, it's it, but if, if we're if we're not going to sort of get people to put these, you know, we do it on blogs. I've done it. But if if we can't get scientists to put those two peer review uh, papers together and say, well, look, those two mean that there's other health effects from radiation and that's not really to kill the industry off because the industry is a dead duck because of renewables they're just so cheap and they're a much better idea because they're spread out evenly there's less chance of them you know like if a nuclear power plant closes down you know you've got to switch on the coal or the gas you know uh, if you've got renewables you can have such a huge amount of renewables that you've got more energy than you need and that extra energy that, that that's not being used in you know because we've got uh, you know they had two demonstrations in china recently you know recently uh, they actually didn't open up they, they, they didn't carry on uh, or, or didn't even bother okay, developing. So that, okay, so they, they may not be able to build their standard nuclear power plants, but they're still selling the SMRs. They're still selling nuclear power. Now, so that you know, is the Ponzi scheme. That's the new Ponzi scheme. This is but really the scary fine. one for me that we really need to stop is having them sell nuclear power in space and nuclear weapons in space. We cannot have nuclear... Nuclear is an intrinsic, did you know that? In the United States Space Force, nuclear is an intrinsic part of it. They plan on having little nuclear wet, uh, power plants out there to charge up their stations. Yeah, I mean, they're doing that anyway. They do plutonium batteries is what, what they, they use. But <clears throat> the thing with that is, is that the particular plutonium they need, they have to keep making fresh. Right. <laughs> and because it's the only plutonium, 
That's why we have nuclear All power plants, isn't it? It's actually needed for other things, you know, in terms of research and development, and that's a bit of a waste uh, off the actual resource, if you like. So there's there's a lot. Of, and the other thing about, the, you know, Trump's space force is, you know, um, I can't remember the amount, but the amount per gram. You now, if you want to send a gram up into space, right, it costs something like, uh, I don't, I don't, I'm going to throw a figure out here, but it, it was a quite ridiculous amount. It was something like a, like $5 million per gram, you know, that kind of thing. So if you want to send a whole space soldier up, you know, if you want to send Captain Kirk up into space, that's going to cost, you know, what, 300 million or something, should we say. Um, if you want to send a, uh, uh, you trillions, know, uh, are you uh, kidding? Maybe two or three if you want trillions. To send up the whole, uh, the whole uh, sort of uh, crowd of Star Trek, you know, up into space. You know, that the whole uh, what do you call it? The whole uh, uh, all the actors. You know, that's going to cost you sixty-eight hundred billion or something. And then if you actually want to send metal up there to build a spaceship, <laughs> you know, it's. I, I mean, you just don't have enough. You know, it, it would bust. It would be even more. Than you know to ha- to get a spaceship, you know, with the soldiers. To me, uh, the, the 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 reason you, you all would, of that is double, in, you would, not, instead of having one and a half trillion a year going to the Pentagon, it would be three trillion a year going but, to, and that's just for one. That's just for one little spaceship with guys driving around with their little guns and tasers and whatever else that they needed to uh, deal with the. Uh, the nasty aliens or whatever they're going to do. No, um, Sean, you know, you know why they're going out there. The only reason they're going out there is they know the planet is toxic. And they are desperately seeking a way to get out of it without crawling into the ground and hiding for two uh, or three hundred years. Every study that's been done so far on the effects of space on the human body and physiology, I mean, look, look, at, look at what happens. The first thing, say if you go to Mars, right? By the time you get to Mars, your body can't move. So when you land, you can't stand up, <laughs> right? And then, on top of that, it damages your eyes. Your eyes start to bulge, and you start going blind. Why? Right? So so when you get there, you won't be able to walk, and you won't be able to see where you're going if you do manage to be able to sort of drop. <laughs> right? So... You know, it, uh, and that's only just the start of it. Then there's all the internal organs. I don't think you know. we planned on that one. Yeah, yeah, it's not going to happen. You couldn't even, I mean, the only possible thing I could see that would happen uh, is human beings starting a base on the moon. It's quite a good idea. I'd be up for doing that. I think, you know, the whole world should chip in to do Um But I would probably guess that quite quickly... The people that would be going up to the moon would only be able to be there for a certain period of time, number one, uh, and number, and they would have to, yeah, it wouldn't be easy. Why would for them people to want to go to the moon? I would not want to go to the moon. I wouldn't want to go to the moon. <laughs> I'd, I'd, be, I'd be up for it, but <laughs> you would, not me. There is no boring. way. You know, that's, you'd be a bit boring. But, but I mean, if, if you're a scientist or something, you could probably think, oh, we can grow ginormous cabbages on the moon or something um i don't i don't i i'm not a scientist so i'm i'm not sure exactly what what they would do up there but the bottom line is yeah no moon base alpha sweet go for it and uh but you know i think it would be too expensive it would cost trillions upon trillions uh to get the materials up there as i hey, said Sean, you know po- we have uh, probably another five or six an minutes fortune, you know we have about five minutes sean just oh, to give oh, you a heads up. Have we had a complete go at a dead Yeah, yeah I'm good. We're oh, recording. Right. He's, this is definitely going to go up on my podcast, and I'm probably not going to edit. I might edit a tiny bit, but not much. I want to okay. ask you one last thing. Do you follow Dave Parrish on YouTube? That's you know, P A R R I S H, Dave. Yeah, no, thanks. Yeah, no, yeah, no. Yeah, he no, does no. the Fuku it, Fridays every Friday, and a couple of weeks ago he had a, maybe it was last week even, maybe two weeks ago, on three eleven eleven, they want to do like a mass meditation to think about a positive outcome 
for Fukushima and for all of this nuclear waste and all these hideous chemical and pollution problems to just meditate on allowing the solution to present itself. That's very White Eagle Lodge of you guys, I have to say. <laughs> have you looked up White Eagle Lodge? No, uh, but I really uh, love the idea. Doyle, guy who wrote Sherlock Holmes, is based in London, and they do colour healing, oh. and they 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 all link up all over the world. Oh, know, I know about you. colour healing. Colour healing actually works, to be honest. Oh, by the yeah. way, the name of that movie is it called The Emerald Forest? Emerald Forest, you got it. You got what did it. you oh, say? Like, this was very um, what of it? White Eagle. Oh, the other thing was, yes, yeah, White Eagle Lodge. The, the, that was basically, it was formed with uh, people like, um, who was it? It was, uh, uh, yeah, you know, the guy who wrote Sherlock Holmes. Um, and uh, a lot of people like that. And uh, they basically, uh, and, and a good friend this of mine. That sounds pretty awesome. Brother of, of that. You know, they did actually ask me, did I want to be a colour healer? I said, no, I just want to kick some nuclear ass, basically. And, this is uh, what it says about White Eagle Lodge. This is the very first statement I see. White Eagle Lodge is a worldwide organization and teaches a universal spiritual path of brotherhood towards all life. I like that. That Maybe that well, is very I White Eagle Lodge of me. <laughs> Kensington? Yeah, it's Kensington. They've got a lodge. They've got a, a building there where they do... Oh, they're uh, in Canada. Yeah, they'll be there as well. And uh, they... they well, I'm, I can't talk about all their inner stuff, but I, I knew one of the inner brothers. He was a very good friend of mine, um, and we used to have really cool conversations. This about, is in uh, Texas, Montgomery, yeah. Texas. Is that right? I, I don't. You know, they're all as you say, they're all over the world, but they actually all. Oh, you mean they're their own church? It's the like a church. Like, huh? Are you telling me that this is a church? Uh. Yeah, kind of, kind of. Yeah, it's a bit like a spiritualist church, to be honest with you. But they're not—they're not into talking to dead people and stuff. They just—they do healing and, and you know, being nice to people, which is not something I, I'm very good at. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, I have to understand. I want to get to this. Where? Where's their address? Oh, it just off the nuclear industry. <laughs> wow. This is interesting. No, I've never heard of this. Huh. What, what Eagle Lodge? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, but they're, 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 they're based... They were actually started by a clairvoyant, uh, who's, who's, uh, whose spiritual name is Minerva, I believe. And uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, when he died, he came back to her... And he was explaining. There's a, there's a book called The Return of Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, it was it's printed by uh, by White Eagle Lodge, and it, and he was explaining what it's like when you die. He, he, so he's saying, "Oh man, it's really wacky up here and stuff." <laughs> quite, and he was talking to his uh, wife and kids. And when I when I got kicked out of London, I went to this place in Devon. And uh, I was talking to the farmer because I was living in a vehicle because I had a uh, special branch and MI5 after me. So I was living in a vehicle with a handful of Sims uh, posting on nuclear news. And I was talking to the farmer whose field I was uh, parked up in. And I was talking to him about Arthur Conan Doyle, which just happened to come up. And he said, oh, do you know, he's actually, he's supposed to be buried in such and such a place, but he's actually buried just round the corner here. <laughs> that was bad. That was really crazy stuff. Wow. But, Hey, hey, Sean, hold on just one second, okay? Uh, I want to thank my audience for listening to us. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show. If you're listening to us on KEPW, your show's going to end right here, but Sean and I are going to keep on going. You can hear the rest of the podcast on my Spreaker channel. Just look for the Age of Fission, and uh, it'll take you right to it, or you can go to my YouTube channel at Nuts for Art, N-U-T-Z-F-O-R-A-R-T, and it will post up there. So put your courage feet on, and we'll talk to you guys in Eugene next week. Thank you for joining the Age of Vision radio show with your host, Lonnie Clark. We'll be back next week to bring you more information about the nuclear industry and the harm it's causing our planet and humanity. Find all of our podcasts 
on Spreaker.com or on YouTube at Nuts for Art, N-U-T-Z-F-O-R-A-R-T. Thank you for being part of the solution.